June 3, 1865, Washington Democrat, Olympia, Washington Territory. From the New York Police Gazette. Sketch of J. Wilkes Booth. We have taken pains to obtain as much information as possible regarding the antecedent of the prominent actor in the fearful tragedy which excites the universal sorrow of the nation and interesting details concerning the immediate relatives of the suspected party. John Wilkes Booth, whose name has been so unexpectedly brought into prominence before the country in connection with the murder of the president, has heretofore been somewhat favorably known as a tragic actor. He is the third son of the well-known English actor Lucius Junius Booth, the rival of the elder Keane and who, in disgust, on being designated as a copyist of that eminent tragedian, left his native land to seek his fortunes in the New World. The marked eccentricities of the elder Booth are familiar to all old playgoers. While his talents are undisputed, his warmest admirers will scarcely deny that his actions at times approached to the verge of dementia. To such an extent was he under the influence of some hereditary influence that it is said he was wont to disentomb the remains of his young child and rehabilitate them in the couch of his affrighted wife. He left four sons and one daughter, Agnes, the wife of Mr. John S. Clark of Philadelphia. The three eldest adopted the stage as a profession, and Junius, Brutus, and Edwin have secured a merited reputation and ample remuneration by their histrionic success. The youngest, Joseph, studied medicine, some say, but we know he was agent for his brother Edwin. He is at present, we understand, in Australia and not in Georgia, as erroneously stated in some of the daily papers. In fact, he left the country prior to the breaking out of hostilities between the North and South. John Wilkes Booth, the immediate subject of our remarks, was born near Bel Air, Hartford County, Maryland, in the year of 1839. His rearing and education was carefully attended to, and a portion of the latter was received at St. Timothy's Hall in Catonsville, Maryland, and his tuition was completed in 1857 at the Newton University in the city of Baltimore. His grandfather was an English politician of ultra-radical school. Booth is a young man possessing marked personal attractions, as may be fully realized from his portrait, which is given in another column. He is some five feet eight inches in height, he has a well-made muscular form, has been a practiced athlete, and has given forcible demonstrations of fistic capability ere this by clearing out bar rooms when angered and under the influence of liquor. He was one of the best pistol shots in the country and a young man of remarkable nerve in every emergency. Only a few days before his arrival in Washington, he made a splendid throwing shot in Boston, firing between his legs and hitting the target so exactly in the center that the proprietor of the gallery preserved it as a memento. While conversing in a Cincinnati barroom a few months ago with the colonel of artillery, Booth was challenged by the latter to hit his hand at 50 paces, the colonel placing his hand against the door. Drawing a derringer and pacing the prescribed distance, the young actor turned and fired at sight, putting his ball through the door between the second and third fingers of the colonel's hand. In dress, he is punctiliously neat, to an extent that would almost attract attention anywhere. His features are regular of the classic mold, his eyes black and hair dark, soft and curly. In youth, he showed no especial predisposition for the stage, seldom indulged in declamatory exercises, but he was wont to harangue his schoolmates in stump speeches evincing much fluency of expression, power and originality. When he approached to manhood, he was following no particular avocation but then we find him donning the sock and buskin, attracted to the stage by the signal success of his brothers Edwin and Junius. It is said that he made his theatrical debut in Philadelphia in 1856. In 1859-1860, he was a leading actor at Montgomery, Alabama, where many looked upon him as not entirely sane. Wounding himself accidentally in the foot, he came north for the sake of his health. Shortly after his arrival here, he made his first appearance in the city at the now Broadway, then Wallach's Old Theater, Miss Mary Provost then being its manager. He has also played star engagements at the Boston Athenaeum and at many of the theaters of the country, but on the whole cannot be said to have achieved any very decided success. 
He has lacked study or preparation, and hence, although possessing histrionic ability, has failed to make his mark, and was merely classed by good critics as a careless actor indifferent to judicious advice. The most successful of his impersonations was his father's great part of Richard III, and on one occasion, in the rendering of it, he displayed an amount of muscularity that sent the Richmond of the night sprawling among the musicians in the orchestra. We find him playing in Boston in 1860 through 61, his ways being then, as an informant tells us, vicious and boyish. The frail fair ones early became the lodestar of his existence, and devotion to rosy god was not wanting. At that time, however, he did not indulge in vulgar drinking bouts. Then his favorite and customary tipple was champagne. Leaving Boston in company with the notorious and beautiful Fanny Brown, the actress, as his cher ami, he traveled through the country playing engagements at different points and with varying pecuniary results. He was generally a favorite in the profession, being esteemed a genial, social, generous, good-hearted but very fast, and in addition to his popularity with the men, his success among the women of his acquaintance was of a remarkably decided character. He is excessively vain, and always seemed to think that the Booth family constituted the cap sheaf of the histrionic profession. He has not appeared on the stage since last November, on which occasion he appeared in conjunction with his brothers Junius and Edwin and E. Very in the celebrated Shakespearean tragedy of Julius Caesar. On that occasion, he assumed the role of Mark Anthony, Edwin appearing as Brutus, Junius as Cassius, and Mr. Very as Caesar. It is said that on that evening, when delivering Mark Anthony's celebrated speech upon the death of Caesar, he interpolated the Virginia motto, Sic Semper Tyrannis, an expression to which he constantly gave utterance since the commencement of our national troubles. Indeed, he never concealed the fact that his political proclivities were entirely with the Southern rebels throughout the progress of the strife. But at the same time, unless when under the influence of liquor, which was not infrequent, he avoided the discussion of public questions and was chary in the expression of his sentiments except among his most intimate friends. We notice in the daily papers a good deal of random talk about Booth's having exhibited recently in a drinking saloon a notched ball with which he declared he intended to shoot the president, and also a statement as to his having used violent gestures and language respecting Mr. Lincoln at the late inauguration ball in Washington. All that may be true enough, but his motive for the perpetration of the atrocious act of which he is accused could not arise from any identity of interest with the South that have been impaired in the progress of events during the last four years. Booth's material interests lay at the North, he being an extensive operator in the oil region of Pennsylvania, and having acquired within a few months past a fortune of some hundred thousand dollars. August 24, 1893, Newburgh Daily Journal, Newburgh, New York. Booth saved Robert Lincoln's life. The following incident was related to a gentleman by Edwin Booth. In the summer of 1877, Mr. Booth was standing on a railroad platform waiting for a train. He noticed a gentleman standing near him, apparently with the same object, and saw that he seemed engrossed in his own meditation. Presently, the gentleman stepped from the platform to a track and began walking upon it, entirely oblivious of his surroundings. Just at this moment, an engine, which had been getting water from a tank near at hand, began backing up the track. Mr. Booth, turning around, saw it only when it was within a few feet of his absent-minded companion. On the impulse of the moment, without attempting to rouse the man to a sense of his danger, there was not time for this, Mr. Booth stepped forward and, clutching him by the arm, lifted it almost bodily upon the platform. So near was the engine that it struck the man's heels as they left the track. The rescued gentleman was so overcome when he realized his danger that he could only bow his thanks and give his hand to his preserver. It happened that Mr. Ford, in whose theater in Washington President Lincoln was assassinated by Mr. Booth's brother, witnessed the scene described above. Stepping forward, he said excitedly, Mr. Booth, do you know who that man was? No, was the reply. It was, said Mr. Ford, Robert Lincoln, President Lincoln's son. Mr. Booth afterward said, 
This act of his gave him more satisfaction than could be represented in any other way. In relating this, Mr. Booth mentioned the fact that the only vote which he ever cast was for Mr. Lincoln when he ran for president the second time. Philadelphia Press.